Chapter 8 Jesus Before Caiaphas Jesus was led across the court, and the mob received him with groans and hisses. As he passed by Peter and John, he looked at them, but without turning his head for fear of betraying them. Scarcely had he reached the council chamber than Caiaphas exclaimed in a loud tone, Thou art come then at last, thou enemy of God, thou blasphemer, who dost disturb the peace of this holy night. The tube which contained the accusations of Annas and was fastened to the pretended scepter in the hands of Jesus was instantly opened and read. Caiaphas made use of the most insulting language, and the archers again struck and abused our Lord, vociferating at the same time, Answer at once! Speak out! Art thou dumb? Caiaphas, whose temper was indescribably proud and arrogant, became even more enraged than Annas had been, and asked a thousand questions, one after the other. But Jesus stood before him in silence, and with his eyes cast down. The archers endeavored to force him to speak by repeated blows, and a malicious child pressed his thumb into his lips, tauntingly bidding him to bite. The witnesses were then called for. The first were persons of the lowest class, whose accusations were as incoherent and inconsistent as those brought forward at the court of Annas, and nothing could be made of them. Caiaphas therefore turned to the principal witnesses, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who had assembled from all parts of the country. They endeavored to speak calmly, but their faces and manner betrayed the virulent envy and hatred with which their hearts were overflowing, and they repeated over and over again the same accusations to which he had already replied so many times, that he cured the sick and cast out devils by the help of devils, that he profaned the Sabbath, incited the people to rebel, called the Pharisees a race of vipers and adulterers, predicted the destruction of Jerusalem, frequented the society of publicans and sinners, assembled the people and gave himself out as a king, a prophet, and the son of God. They deposed that he was constantly speaking of his kingdom, that he forbade divorce, called himself the bread of life, and said that whoever did not eat his flesh and drink his blood would not have eternal life. Thus did they distort and misinterpret the words he had uttered, the instructions he had given, and the parables by which he had illustrated his instructions, giving them the semblance of crimes. But these witnesses could not agree in their depositions, for one said, He calls himself king, and a second instantly contradicted, saying, No, he allows persons to call him so, but directly they attempted to proclaim him, he fled. Another said, He calls himself the Son of God. But he was interrupted by a fourth, who exclaimed, No, he only styles himself the Son of God, because he does the will of his heavenly Father. Some of the witnesses stated that he had cured them, but that their diseases had returned, and that his pretended cures were only performed by magic. They spoke likewise of the cure of the paralytic man at the pool of Bethsaida, but they distorted the facts so as to give them the semblance of crimes. And even in these accusations they could not agree, contradicting one another. The Pharisees of Sephorus, with whom he had once had a discussion on the subject of divorces, accused him of teaching false doctrines, and a young man of Nazareth, whom he had refused to allow to become one of his disciples, was likewise base enough to bear witness against him. It was found to be utterly impossible to prove a single fact, and the witnesses appeared to come forward for the sole purpose of insulting Jesus, rather than to demonstrate the truth of their statements. Whilst they were disputing with one another, Caiaphas and some of the other members of the council employed themselves in questioning Jesus, and turning his answers into derision. What species of king art thou? Give proofs of thy power. Call the legions of angels whom thou didst speak in the Garden of Olives. What hast thou done with the money given unto thee by the widows, and other simpletons whom thou didst seduce by thy false doctrines? Answer at once. Speak out. Art thou dumb? Thou wouldst have been far wiser to have kept silence when in the midst of the foolish mob. There thou didst speak far too much." All these questions were accompanied by blows from the underservants of the members of the tribunal, and had our Lord not been supported from above, he could not have survived this treatment. Some of the base witnesses endeavored to prove that he was an illegitimate son, but others declared that his mother was a pious virgin belonging to the temple, and that they afterwards saw her betrothed to a man who feared God. The witnesses upbraided Jesus and his disciples with not having offered sacrifice in the temple. It is true that I never did see either Jesus or his disciples offer any sacrifice in the temple excepting the paschal lamb, 
But Joseph and Anna used frequently during their lifetime to offer sacrifice for the child Jesus. However, even this accusation was puerile, for the Essenians never offered sacrifice, and no one thought the less well of them for not doing so. The enemies of Jesus still continued to accuse him of being a sorcerer, and Caiaphas affirmed several times that the confusion in the statements of the witnesses was caused solely by witchcraft. Some said that he had eaten the paschal lamb on the previous day, which was contrary to the law, and that the year before he had made different alterations in the manner of celebrating this ceremony. But the witnesses contradicted one another to such a degree that Caiaphas and his adherents found, to their very great annoyance and anger, that not one accusation could be really proved. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were called up, and being commanded to say how it happened that they had allowed him to eat the pasch on the wrong day in a room which belonged to them, they proved from ancient documents that from time immemorial the Galileans had been allowed to eat the pasch a day earlier than the rest of the Jews. They added that every other part of the ceremony had been performed according to the directions given in the law, and that persons belonging to the temple were present at the supper. This quite puzzled the witnesses, and Nicodemus increased the rage of the enemies of Jesus by pointing out the passages in the archives which proved the right of the Galileans, and gave the reason for which this privilege was granted. The reason was this. The sacrifices would not have been finished by the Sabbath if the immense multitudes who congregated together for that purpose had all been obliged to perform the ceremony on the same day. And although the Galileans had not always profited by this rite, yet its existence was incontestably proved by Nicodemus. And the anger of the Pharisees was heightened by his remarking that the members of the council had caused to be greatly offended at the gross contradictions in the statements of the witnesses, and that the extraordinary and hurried manner in which the whole affair had been conducted showed that malice and envy were the sole motives which induced the accusers, and made them bring the case forward at a moment when all were busied in the preparations for the most solemn feast of the year. They looked at Nicodemus furiously, and could not reply, but continued to question the witnesses in a still more precipitate and imprudent manner. Two witnesses at last came forward, who said, This man said, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another not made with hands. However, even these witnesses did not agree in their statements, for one said that the accused wished to build a new temple, and that he had eaten the pasch in an unusual place, because he desired the destruction of the ancient temple. But the other said, Not so. The edifice where he ate the pasch was built by human hands, therefore he could not have referred to that. The wrath of Caiaphas was indescribable. For the cruel treatment which Jesus had suffered, his divine patience, and the contradictions of the witnesses were beginning to make a great impression on many persons present. A few hisses were heard, and the hearts of some were so touched that they could not silence the voice of their consciences. Ten soldiers left the court under pretext of indisposition, but in reality overcome by their feelings. As they passed by the place where Peter and John were standing, they exclaimed, The silence of Jesus of Nazareth in the midst of such cruel treatment is superhuman. It would melt a heart of iron. The wonder is that the earth does not open and swallow such reprobates as his accusers must be. But tell us, where must we go? The two apostles either mistrusted the soldiers and thought they were only seeking to betray them, or they were fearful of being recognized by those around and denounced as disciples of Jesus, for they only made answer in a melancholy tone, If truth calls you, follow it, and all will come right of itself. The soldiers instantly went out of the room and left Jerusalem soon after. They met persons on the outskirts of the town who directed them to the caverns which lay to the south of Jerusalem, on the other side of Mount Zion, where many of the apostles had taken refuge. These latter were at first alarmed at seeing strangers enter their hiding place, but the soldiers soon dispelled all fear and gave them an account of the sufferings of Jesus. The temper of Caiaphas, which was already perturbed, became quite infuriated by the contradictory statements of these last two witnesses, and rising from his seat he approached Jesus and said, Answerest thou nothing to the things which these witness against thee? Jesus neither raised his head nor looked at the high priest, which increased the anger of the latter to the greatest degree. And the archers, perceiving this, seized our Lord by the hair, pulled his head back, and gave him blows under the chin. But he still kept his eyes cast down. 
Caiaphas raised his hands and exclaimed in an enraged tone, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tellest if thou be Christ the Messiah, the Son of the living God. A momentary and solemn pause ensued. Then Jesus, in a majestic and superhuman voice, replied, Thou hast said it. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power of God and coming in the clouds of heaven. Whilst Jesus was pronouncing these words, a bright light appeared to me to surround him. Heaven was opened above his head. I saw the Eternal Father, but no words from a human pen can describe the intuitive view that was then vouchsafed me of him. I likewise saw the angels and the prayers of the just ascending to the throne of God, at the same moment I perceived the yawning abyss of hell like a fiery meteor at the feet of Caiaphas. It was filled with horrible devils. A slight gauze alone appeared to separate him from its dark flames. I could see the demoniacal fury with which its heart was overflowing, and the whole house looked to me like hell. At the moment that our Lord pronounced the solemn words, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, hell appeared to be shaken from one extremity to the other, and then, as it were, to burst forth and inundate every person in the house of Caiaphas with feelings of redoubled hatred toward our Lord. These things are always shown to me under the appearance of some material object which renders them less difficult of comprehension and impresses them in a more clear and forcible manner on the mind because we ourselves being material beings, facts are more easily illustrated in our regard if manifested through the medium of the senses. The despair and fury which these words produced in hell were shown to me under the appearance of a thousand terrific figures in different places. I remember seeing, among other frightful things, a number of little black objects, like dogs with claws, which walked on their hind legs. I knew at the time what kind of wickedness was indicated by this apparition, but I cannot remember now. I saw these horrible phantoms enter into the bodies of the greatest part of the bystanders, or else place themselves on their head or shoulders. I likewise at this moment saw frightful specters come out of the sepulchres on the other side of Sion. I believe they were evil spirits." I saw in the neighborhood of the temple many other apparitions which resembled prisoners loaded with chains. I do not know whether they were demons or souls condemned to remain in some particular part of the earth and who were then going to limbo which our Lord's condemnation to death had opened to them. It is extremely difficult to explain these facts for fear of scandalizing those who have no knowledge of such things, but persons who see feel them and they often cause the very hair to stand on end on the head. I think that John saw some of these apparitions, for I heard him speak about them afterwards. All whose hearts were not radically corrupted felt excessively terrified at these events, but the hardened were sensible of nothing but an increase of hatred and anger against our Lord. Caiaphas then arose, and urged on by Satan, took up the end of his mantle, pierced it with his knife, and rent it from one end to the other, exclaiming at the same time in a loud voice, He hath blasphemed! What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard the blasphemy. What think you? All who were then present arose and exclaimed with astounding malignancy, He is guilty of death! During the whole of this frightful scene, the devils were in the most tremendous state of excitement. They appeared to have complete possession, not only of the enemies of Jesus, but likewise of their partisans and cowardly followers. The powers of darkness seemed to me to proclaim a triumph over the light, and the few among the spectators whose hearts still retained a glimmering of light were filled with such consternation that covering their heads they instantly departed. The witnesses who belonged to the upper classes were less hardened than the others. Their consciences were racked with remorse, and they followed the example given by the persons mentioned above, and left the room as quickly as possible, while the rest crowded round the fire in the vestibule and ate and drank after receiving full pay for their services. The high priest then addressed the archers and said, I deliver this king up into your hands. Render the blasphemer the honors which are his due." After these words he retired with the members of his council into the round room behind the tribunal which could not be seen from the vestibule. In the midst of the bitter affliction which inundated the heart of John, his thoughts were with the mother of Jesus. 
He feared that the dreadful news of the condemnation of her son might be communicated to her suddenly, or that perhaps some enemy might give the information in a heartless manner. He therefore looked at Jesus, and saying in a low voice, Lord, thou knowest why I leave thee, went away quickly to seek the Blessed Virgin, as if he had been sent by Jesus himself. Peter was quite overcome between anxiety and sorrow, which joined to fatigue made him chilly. Therefore, as the morning was cold, he went up to the fire where many of the common people were warming themselves. He did his best to hide his grief in their presence, as he could not make up his mind to go home and leave his beloved master. Chapter 9 The Insults Received by Jesus in the Court of Caiaphas No sooner did Caiaphas, with the other members of the council, leave the tribunal than a crowd of miscreants, the very scum of the people, surrounded Jesus like a swarm of infuriated wasps and began to heap every imaginable insult upon him. Even during the trial, whilst the witnesses were speaking, the archers and some others could not restrain their cruel inclinations, but pulled out handfuls of his hair and beard, spat upon him, struck him with their fists, wounded him with sharp-pointed sticks, and even ran needles into his body. But when Caiaphas left the hall, they set no bounds to their barbarity. They first placed a crown made of straw and the bark of trees upon his head, and then took it off, saluting him at the same time with insulting expressions like the following, Behold, the son of David, wearing the crown of his father. A greater than Solomon is here. This is the king who is preparing a wedding feast for his son. Thus did they turn into ridicule those eternal truths which he had taught under the form of parables to those whom he came from heaven to save. And whilst repeating these scoffing words, they continued to strike him with their fists and sticks and to spit in his face. Next, they put a crown of reeds upon his head, took off his robe and scapular, and then threw an old torn mantle, which scarcely reached his knees, over his shoulders. Around his neck they hung a long iron chain, with an iron ring at each end studded with sharp points, which bruised and tore his knees as he walked. They again pinioned his arms, put a reed into his hand, and covered his divine countenance with spittle. They had already thrown all sorts of filth over his hair, as well as over his chest and upon the old mantle. They bound his eyes with a dirty rag, and struck him, crying out at the same time in loud tones, Prophesy unto us, O Christ, who is he that struck thee? He answered not one word, but sighed, and prayed inwardly for them. After many more insults, they seized the chain which was hanging on his neck, dragged him towards the room into which the council had withdrawn, and with their sticks forced him in, vociferating at the same time, March forward, thou king of straw! Show thyself to the council with the insignia of the regal honors we have rendered unto thee. A large body of councillors, with Caiaphas at their head, were still in the room, and they looked with both delight and approbation at the shameful scene which was enacted, beholding with pleasure the most sacred ceremonies turned into derision. The pitiless guards covered him with mud and spittle, and with mock gravity exclaimed, Receive the prophetic unction, the regal unction. Then they impiously parodied the baptismal ceremonies, and the pious act of Magdalene in emptying the vase of perfume on his head. How canst thou presume, they exclaimed, to appear before the council in such a condition? Thou dost purify others, and thou art not pure thyself. But we will soon purify thee. They fetched a basin of dirty water, which they poured over his face and shoulders, whilst they bent their knees before him, and exclaimed, Behold thy precious unction, behold the spikenard worth three hundred pence. Thou hast been baptized in the pool of Bethsaida. They intended by this to throw into ridicule the act of respect and veneration showed by Magdalene when she poured the precious ointment over his head at the house of the Pharisee. By their derisive words concerning his baptism in the pool of Bethsaida, they pointed out, although unintentionally, the resemblance between Jesus and the paschal lamb, for the lambs were washed in the first place in the pond near the Probatica gate, and then brought to the pool of Bethsaida, where they underwent another purification before being taken to the temple to be sacrificed. The enemies of Jesus likewise alluded to the man who had been infirm for thirty-eight years and who was cured by Jesus at the pool of Bethsaida. For I saw this man either washed or baptized there. 
I say either washed or baptized because I do not exactly remember the circumstances. They then dragged Jesus around the room before all the members of the council who continued to address him in reproachful and abusive language. Every countenance looked diabolical and enraged, and all around was dark, confused, and terrible. Our Lord, on the contrary, was from the moment that he declared himself to be the Son of God, generally surrounded with a halo of light. Many of the assembly appeared to have a confused knowledge of this fact, and to be filled with consternation at perceiving that neither outrages nor ignominies could alter the majestic expression of his countenance. The halo which shone around Jesus from the moment he declared himself to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, served but to incite his enemies to greater fury, and yet it was so resplendent that they could not look at it, and I believe their intention in throwing the dirty rag over his head was to deaden its brightness. Chapter 10 The Denial of St. Peter At the moment when Jesus uttered the words, Thou hast said it, and the high priest rent his garment, the whole room resounded with tumultuous cries. Peter and John, who had suffered intensely during the scene which had just been enacted, and which they had been obliged to witness in silence, could bear the sight no longer. Peter, therefore, got up to leave the room, and John followed soon after. The latter went to the Blessed Virgin, who was in the house of Martha with the holy women. But Peter's love for Jesus was so great that he could not make up his mind to leave him. His heart was bursting, and he wept bitterly, although he endeavored to restrain and hide his tears. It was impossible for him to remain in the tribunal, as his deep emotion at the sight of his beloved master's sufferings would have betrayed him. Therefore he went into the vestibule and approached the fire, around which soldiers and common people were sitting and talking in the most heartless and disgusting manner concerning the sufferings of Jesus, and relating all that they themselves had done to him. Peter was silent, but his silence and dejected demeanor made the bystanders suspect something. The portress came up to the fire in the midst of the conversation, cast a bold glance at Peter, and said, Thou also wast with Jesus the Galilean. These words startled and alarmed Peter. He trembled as to what might ensue if he owned the truth before his brutal companions, and therefore answered quickly, Woman, I know him not, got up and left the vestibule. At this moment the cock crowed somewhere in the outskirts of the town. I do not remember hearing it, but I felt that it was crowing. As he went out, another maidservant looked at him and said to those who were with her, This man was also with him. And the persons she addressed immediately demanded of Peter whether her words were true, saying, Are thou not one of this man's disciples? Peter was even more alarmed than before and renewed his denial in these words, I am not, I know not the man. He left the inner court and entered the exterior court. He was weeping, and so great was his anxiety and grief that he did not reflect in the least on the words he had just uttered. The exterior court was quite filled with persons, and some had climbed onto the top of the wall to listen to what was going on in the inner court which they were forbidden to enter. A few of the disciples were likewise there, for their anxiety concerning Jesus was so great that they could not make up their minds to remain concealed in the caves of Hinnom. They came up to Peter, and with many tears questioned him concerning their beloved master, but he was so unnerved and so fearful of betraying himself that he briefly recommended them to go away as it was dangerous to remain, and left them instantly. He continued to indulge his violent grief while they hastened to leave the town. I recognized among these disciples, who were about sixteen in number, Bartholomew, Nathaniel, Saturninus, Judas Barsabius, Simon, who was afterwards bishop of Jerusalem, Zacchaeus, and Monahem, the man who was born blind and cured by our Lord. Peter could not rest anywhere, and his love for Jesus prompted him to return to the inner court, which he was allowed to enter because Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had in the first instance taken him in. He did not re-enter the vestibule, but turned to the right and went towards the round room which was behind the tribunal, and in which Jesus was undergoing every possible insult and ignominy from his cruel enemies. Peter walked timidly up to the door, and although perfectly conscious that he was suspected by all present of being a partisan of Jesus, yet he could not remain outside. His love for his master impelled him forward. 
He entered the room, advanced, and soon stood in the very midst of the brutal throng who were feasting their cruel eyes on the sufferings of Jesus. They were at that moment dragging him ignominiously backwards and forwards with the crown of straw upon his head. He cast a sorrowful and even severe glance upon Peter, which cut him to the heart. But as he was still much alarmed, and at that moment heard some of the bystanders call out, Who is that man? He went back again into the court, and seeing that the persons in the vestibule were watching him, came up to the fire and remained before it for some time. Several persons who had observed his anxious, troubled countenance began to speak in opprobrious terms of Jesus, and one of them said to him, Thou also art one of his disciples. Thou also art a Galilean, thy very speech betrays thee. Peter got up, intending to leave the room, when a brother of Malchus came up to him and said, Did I not see thee in the garden with him? Didst thou not cut off my brother's ear? Peter became almost beside himself with terror. He began to curse and to swear that he knew not the man, and ran out of the vestibule into the outer court. The cock then crowed again, and Jesus, who at that moment was led across the court, cast a look of mingled compassion and grief upon his apostle. This look of our Lord pierced Peter to the very heart. It recalled to his mind in the most forcible and terrible manner the words addressed to him by our Lord on the previous evening, Before the cock crows twice, thou shalt thrice deny me. He had forgotten all his promises and protestations to our Lord that he would die rather than deny him. He had forgotten the warning given to him by our Lord. But when Jesus looked at him, he felt the enormity of his fault, and his heart was nigh bursting with grief. He had denied his Lord. When that beloved master was outraged, insulted, delivered up into the hands of unjust judges, when he was suffering all in patience and in silence. His feelings of remorse were beyond expression. He returned to the exterior court, covered his face, and wept bitterly. All fear of being recognized was over. He was ready to proclaim to the whole universe both his fault and his repentance. What man will dare assert that he would have shown more courage than Peter? If, with his quick and ardent temperament, he were exposed to such danger, trouble, and sorrow, at a moment, too, when completely unnerved between fear and grief, and exhausted by the sufferings of this sad night. Our Lord left Peter to his own strength, and he was weak. Like all who forget the words, watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. Chapter 11 Mary in the House of Caiaphas The Blessed Virgin was ever united to her Divine Son by interior spiritual communications. She was, therefore, fully aware of all that happened to Him. She suffered with Him and joined in His continual prayer for His murderers. But her maternal feelings prompted her to supplicate Almighty God most ardently not to suffer the crime to be completed and to save her Son from such dreadful torments. She eagerly desired to return to him. And when John, who had left the tribunal at the moment the frightful cry, He is guilty of death, was raised, came to the house of Lazarus to see after her and to relate the particulars of the dreadful scene he had just witnessed, she, as also Magdalene and some of the other holy women, begged to be taken to the place where Jesus was suffering. John, who had only left our Savior in order to console her, whom he loved best next to his divine Master, instantly acceded to their request, and conducted them through the streets, which were lighted up by the moon alone, and crowded with persons hastening to their homes. The holy women were closely veiled, but the sobs which they could not restrain made many who passed by observe them, and their feelings were harrowed by the abusive epithets they overheard bestowed upon Jesus by those who were conversing on the subject of his arrest. The Blessed Virgin, who ever beheld in spirit the opprobrious treatment which her dear son was receiving, continued to lay up all these things in her heart. Like him she suffered in silence, but more than once she became totally unconscious. Some disciples of Jesus, who were returning from the hall of Caiaphas, saw her fainting in the arms of the holy women, and touched with pity, stopped to look at her compassionately, and saluted her in these words. 
Hail, unhappy mother! Hail, mother of the Most Holy One of Israel, the most afflicted of all mothers! Mary raised her head, thanked them gratefully, and continued her sad journey. When in the vicinity of Caiaphas's house, their grief was renewed by the sight of a group of men who were busily occupied under a tent, making the cross ready for our Lord's crucifixion. The enemies of Jesus had given orders that the cross should be prepared directly after his arrest, that they might, without delay, execute the sentence which they hoped to persuade Pilate to pass on him. The Romans had already prepared the crosses of the two thieves, and the workmen who were making that of Jesus were much annoyed at being obliged to labor at it during the night. They did not attempt to conceal their anger at this, and uttered the most frightful oaths and curses which pierced the heart of the tender mother of Jesus through and through. But she prayed for these blind creatures, who thus unknowingly blasphemed the Savior who was about to die for their salvation, and prepared the cross for his cruel execution. Mary, John, and the holy women traversed the outer court attached to Caiaphas's house. They stopped under the archway of a door which opened to the inner court. Mary's heart was with her divine son, and she desired most ardently to see this door opened, that she might again have a chance of beholding him, for she knew that it alone separated her from the prison where he was confined. The door was at length opened, and Peter rushed out, his face covered with his mantle, wringing his hands and weeping bitterly. By the light of the torches he soon recognized John and the Blessed Virgin, but the sight of them only renewed those dreadful feelings of remorse which the look of Jesus had awakened in his breast. Mary approached him instantly and said, Simon, tell me, I entreat you, what has become of Jesus, my son? These words pierced his very heart. He could not even look at her, but turned away and again wrung his hands. Mary drew close to him and said in a voice trembling with emotion, Simon, son of John, why dost thou not answer me? Mother, exclaimed Peter in a dejected tone, O oh, mother, speak not to me. Thy son is suffering more than words can express. Speak not to me. They have condemned him to death, and I have denied him three times. John came up to ask a few more questions, but Peter ran out of the court as if beside himself, and did not stop for a single moment until he reached the cave at Mount Olivet that cave on the stones of which the impression of the hands of our Savior had been miraculously left. I believe it is the cave in which Adam took refuge to weep after his fall. The Blessed Virgin was inexpressibly grieved at hearing of the fresh pang inflicted on the loving heart of her divine Son, the pang of hearing himself denied by that disciple who had first acknowledged him as the Son of the living God. She was unable to support herself and fell down at the doorstone, upon which the impression of her feet and hands remains to the present day. I have seen the stones, which are preserved somewhere, but I cannot at this moment remember where. The door was not again shut, for the crowd was dispersing, and when the Blessed Virgin came to herself, she begged to be taken to some place as near as possible to her divine Son. John therefore led her and the holy women to the front of the prison where Jesus was confined. Mary was with Jesus in spirit, and Jesus was with her. But this loving mother wished to hear with her own ears the voice of her divine Son. She listened and heard not only his moans, but also the abusive language of those around him. It was impossible for the holy women to remain in the court any longer without attracting attention. The grief of Magdalene was so violent that she was unable to conceal it. And although the Blessed Virgin, by a special grace from Almighty God, maintained a calm and dignified exterior in the midst of her sufferings, Yet even she was recognized, and overheard harsh words such as these, Is not that the mother of the Galilean? Her son will most certainly be executed, but not before the festival, unless indeed he is the greatest of criminals. The Blessed Virgin left the court, and went up to the fireplace in the vestibule, where a certain number of persons were still standing. When she reached the spot where Jesus had said that he was the Son of God, and the wicked Jews cried out, He is guilty of death, she again fainted, and John and the holy women carried her away, in appearance more like a corpse than a living person. The bystanders said not a word. They seemed struck with astonishment and silence, such as might have been produced in hell by the passage of a celestial being reigned in that vestibule. The holy women again passed the place where the cross was being prepared. The workmen appeared to find as much difficulty in completing it as the judges had found in pronouncing sentence, 
and were obliged to fetch fresh wood every moment, for some bits would not fit, and others split. This continued until the different species of wood were placed in the cross according to the intentions of divine providence. I saw angels who obliged these men to recommence their work, and who would not let them rest until all was accomplished in a proper manner. But my remembrance of this vision is indistinct. Chapter 12 Jesus confined in the subterranean prison. The Jews, having quite exhausted their barbarity, shut Jesus up in a little vaulted prison, the remains of which subsist to this day. Two of the archers alone remained with him, and they were soon replaced by two others. He was still clothed in the old dirty mantle and covered with the spittle and other filth which they had thrown over him, for they had not allowed him to put on his own clothes again, but kept his hands tightly bound together. When our Lord entered this prison, he prayed most fervently that his heavenly Father would accept all that he had already suffered and all that he was about to suffer as an expiatory sacrifice, not only for his executioners, but likewise for all who in future ages might have to suffer torments such as he was about to endure and be tempted to impatience or anger. The enemies of our Lord did not allow him a moment's respite, even in this dreary prison, but tied him to a pillar which stood in the center and would not allow him to lean upon it, although he was so exhausted from ill-treatment the weight of his chains and his numerous falls that he could scarcely support himself on his swollen and torn feet. Never for a moment did they cease insulting him, and when the first set were tired out, others replaced them. It is quite impossible to describe all that the Holy of Holies suffered from these heartless beings, for the sight affected me so excessively that I became really ill, and I felt as if I could not survive it. We ought indeed to be ashamed of that weakness and susceptibility which renders us unable to listen composedly to the descriptions or speak without repugnance of those sufferings which our Lord endured so calmly and patiently for our salvation. The horror we feel is as great as that of a murderer who is forced to place his hands upon the wounds he himself has inflicted on his victim. Jesus endured all without opening his mouth, and it was man, sinful man, who perpetrated all these outrages against one who was at once their brother, their redeemer, and their God. I too am a great sinner, and my sins cause these sufferings. At the day of judgment, when the most hidden things will be manifested, we shall see the share we have had in the torments endured by the Son of God. We shall see how far we have caused them by the sins we so frequently commit, and which are, in fact, a species of consent which we give to, and a participation in, the tortures which were inflicted on Jesus by his cruel enemies. If, alas, we reflected seriously on this, we should repeat with much greater fervor the words which we find so often in prayer books, Lord, grant that I may die rather than ever willfully offend Thee again by sin. Jesus continued to pray for His enemies, and they, being at last tired out, left Him in peace for a short time, when He leaned against the pillar to rest, and a bright light shone around Him. The day was beginning to dawn, the day of His passion, of our redemption, and a faint ray penetrating the narrow vent hole of the prison fell upon the holy and immaculate Lamb who had taken upon Himself the sins of the world. Jesus turned towards the ray of light, raised His fettered hands, and in the most touching manner returned thanks to His heavenly Father for the dawn of that day which had been so long desired by the prophets and for which he himself had so ardently sighed from the moment of his birth on earth, and concerning which he had said to his disciples, I have a baptism wherewith I am to be baptized, and how am I straitened until it be accomplished? I prayed with him, but I cannot give the words of his prayer, for I was so completely overcome and touched to hear him return thanks to his Father for the terrible sufferings which he had already endured for me, and for the still greater which he was about to endure. I could only repeat over and over with the greatest fervor, Lord, I beseech Thee, give me these sufferings. They belong to me. I have deserved them in punishment for my sins. I was quite overwhelmed with feelings of love and compassion when I looked upon Him thus welcoming the first dawn of the great day of His sacrifice, 
and that ray of light which penetrated into his prison might indeed be compared to the visit of a judge who wishes to be reconciled to a criminal before the sentence of death which he has pronounced upon him is executed. The archers who were dozing woke up for a moment and looked at him with surprise. They said nothing but appeared to be somewhat astonished and frightened. Our divine Lord was confined in this prison an hour or thereabouts. While Jesus was in this dungeon, Judas, who had been wandering up and down the valley of Hinnom like a madman, directed his steps towards the house of Caiaphas, with the thirty pieces of silver, the reward of his treachery, still hanging to his waist. All was silent around, and he addressed himself to some of the sentinels, without letting them know who he was, and asked what was going to be done to the Galilean. He has been condemned to death, and he will certainly be crucified, was the reply. Judas walked to and fro and listened to the different conversations which were held concerning Jesus. Some spoke of the cruel treatment he had received, others of his astonishing patience, while others again discoursed concerning the solemn trial which was to take place in the morning before the great council. Whilst the traitor was listening eagerly to the different opinions given, day dawned. The members of the tribunal commenced their preparations, and Judas slunk behind the building that he might not be seen, for like Cain he sought to hide himself from human eyes, and despair was beginning to take possession of his soul. The place in which he took refuge happened to be the very spot where the workmen had been preparing the wood for making the cross of our Lord. All was in readiness, and the men were asleep by its side. Judas was filled with horror at the sight. He shuddered and fled when he beheld the instrument of that cruel death to which, for a paltry sum of money, he had delivered up his lord and master. He ran to and fro in perfect agonies of remorse, and finally hid himself in an adjoining cave where he determined to await the trial which was to take place in the morning. Chapter 13 The Morning Trial Caiaphas, Annas, the ancients, and the scribes assembled again in the morning in the great hall of the tribunal to have a legal trial, as meetings at night were not lawful and could only be looked upon in the light of preparatory audiences. The majority of the members had slept in the house of Caiaphas, where beds had been prepared for them, but some, and among them Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, had gone home and returned at the dawn of day. The meeting was crowded, and the members commenced their operations in the most hurried manner possible. They wished to condemn Jesus to death at once, but Nicodemus, Joseph, and some others opposed their wishes and demanded that the decision should be deferred until after the festival, for fear of causing an insurrection among the people, maintaining likewise that no criminal could be justly condemned upon charges which were not proved, and that in the case now before them all the witnesses contradicted one another. The high priests and their adherents became very angry, and told Joseph and Nicodemus in plain terms that they were not surprised at their expressing displeasure in what had been done, because they were themselves partisans of the Galilean and his doctrines, and were fearful of being convicted. The high priest even went so far as to endeavor to exclude from the council all those members who were in the slightest degree favorable to Jesus. These members protested that they washed their hands of all the future proceedings of the council, and leaving the room went to the temple, and from this day never again took their seats in the council. Caiaphas then ordered the guards to bring Jesus once more into his presence, and to prepare everything for taking him to Pilate's court directly he should have pronounced sentence. The emissaries of the council hurried off to the prison, and with their usual brutality untied the hands of Jesus, dragged off the old mantle which they had thrown over his shoulders, made him put on his own soiled garment, and having fastened ropes around his waist, dragged him out of the prison. The appearance of Jesus when he passed through the midst of the crowd who were already assembled in the front of the house was that of a victim led to be sacrificed. His countenance was totally changed and disfigured from ill usage and his garments stained and torn. But the sight of his sufferings, far from exciting a feeling of compassion in the hard-hearted Jews, simply filled them with disgust and increased their rage. Pity was indeed a feeling unknown in their cruel breasts. Caiaphas, who did not make the slightest effort to conceal his hatred, addressed our Lord haughtily in these words, If thou be Christ, tell us plainly. Then Jesus raised his head and answered with great dignity and calmness, If I shall tell you, you will not believe me. And if I shall also ask you, you will not answer me or let me go. 
But hereafter the Son of Man shall be sitting on the right hand of the power of God. The high priest looked at one another and said to Jesus with a disdainful laugh, Art thou then the Son of God? And Jesus answered with the voice of eternal truth, You say that I am. At these words they all exclaimed, What need have we any further testimony? For we ourselves have heard it from his own mouth. They all arose instantly and vied with each other as to who should heap the most abusive epithets upon Jesus, whom they termed a low-born miscreant, who aspired to being their Messiah and pretended to be entitled to sit at the right hand of God. They ordered the archers to tie his hands again and to fasten a chain round his neck. This was usually done to criminals condemned to death. And then they prepared to conduct him to Pilate's hall, where a messenger had already been dispatched to beg him to have all in readiness for trying a criminal, as it was necessary to make no delay on account of the festival day. The Jewish priests murmured among themselves at being obliged to apply to the Roman governor for the confirmation of their sentence, but it was necessary, as they had not the right of condemning criminals, excepting for things which concerned religion and the temple alone, and they could not pass a sentence of death. They wished to prove that Jesus was an enemy of the emperor, and this accusation concerned those departments which were under Pilate's jurisdiction. The soldiers were all standing in front of the house, surrounded by a large body of the enemies of Jesus, and of common persons attracted by curiosity. The high priests and a part of the council walked at the head of the procession, and Jesus, led by archers and guarded by soldiers, followed, while the mob brought up the rear. They were obliged to descend Mount Zion and cross a part of the lower town to reach Pilate's palace, and many priests who had attended the council went to the temple directly afterwards, as it was necessary to prepare for the festival. Chapter 14 The Despair of Judas Whilst the Jews were conducting Jesus to Pilate, the traitor Judas walked about, listening to the conversation of the crowd who followed, and his ears were struck by words such as these, They are taking him before Pilate. The high priests have condemned the Galilean to death. He will be crucified. They will accomplish his death. He has been already dreadfully ill-treated. His patience is wonderful. He answers not. His only words are that he is the Messiah and that he will be seated at the right hand of God. They will crucify him on account of those words. Had he not said them, they could not have condemned him to death. The miscreant who sold him was one of his disciples and had a short time before eaten the paschal lamb with him. Not for worlds would I have had to do such an act. However guilty the Galilean may be, he has not at all events sold his friend for money. Such an infamous character as this disciple is infinitely more deserving of death. Then, but too late, anguish, despair, and remorse took possession of the mind of Judas. Satan instantly prompted him to fly. He fled as if a thousand furies were at his heel, and the bag which was hanging at his side struck him as he ran, and propelled him as a spur from hell. But he took it into his hand to prevent its blows. He fled as fast as possible. But where did he fly? Not towards the crowd, that he might cast himself at the feet of Jesus, his merciful Savior, implore his pardon, and beg to die with him. Not to confess his fault with true repentance before God, but to endeavor to unburden himself before the world of his crime and of the price of his treachery. He ran like one beside himself into the temple, where several members of the council had gathered together after the judgment of Jesus. They looked at one another with astonishment and then turned their haughty countenances on which a smile of irony was visible upon Judas. He, with a frantic gesture, tore the thirty pieces of silver from his side, and holding them forth with his right hand, exclaimed in accents of the most deep despair, Take back your silver, that silver with which you bribed me to betray this just man. Take back your silver. Release, Jesus. Our compact is at an end. I have sinned grievously, for I have betrayed innocent blood. The priests answered him in the most contemptuous manner and, as if fearful of contaminating themselves by the contact of the reward of the traitor, would not touch the silver he tended, but replied, What have we to do with thy sin? If thou thinkest to have sold innocent blood, it is thine own affair. We know what we have paid for, and we have judged him worthy of death. Thou hast thy money, say no more. 
They addressed these words to him in the abrupt tone in which men usually speak when anxious to get rid of a troublesome person, and instantly arose and walked away. These words filled Judas with such rage and despair that he became almost frantic. His hair stood on end on his head. He rent in two the bag which contained the thirty pieces of silver, cast them down in the temple, and fled to the outskirts of the town. I again beheld him rushing to and fro like a madman in the valley of Hinnom. Satan was by his side in a hideous form, whispering in his ear, to endeavor to drive him to despair. All the curses which the prophets had hurled upon this valley where the Jews formerly sacrificed their children to idols. It appeared as if all these maledictions were directed against him, as in these words, for instance, they shall go forth and behold the carcasses of those who have sinned against me, whose worm dieth not, and whose fires shall never be extinguished. When he reached the torrent of Cedron and saw Mount Olivet, he shuddered, turned away, and again the words vibrated in his ear, Friend, whereto art thou come? Judas, dost thou betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Horror filled his soul, his head began to wander, and the arch-fiend again whispered, It was here that David crossed the Cedron when he fled from Absalom. Absalom put an end to his life by hanging himself. It was of thee that David spoke when he said, And they repaid me evil for good, hatred for my love. May the devil stand at his right hand. When he is judged, may he go out condemned." May his days be few, and his bishopric let another take. May the iniquity of his father be remembered in the sight of the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out, because he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor man and the beggar and the broken in heart to put him to death. And he loved cursing, and it shall come unto him. And he put on cursing like a garment, and it went in like water into his entrails, and like oil into his bones. May it be unto him like a garment which covereth him, and like a girdle, with which he is girded continually. Overcome by these terrible thoughts, Judas rushed on and reached the foot of the mountain. It was a dreary, desolate spot, filled with rubbish and putrid remains. Discordant sounds from the city reverberated in his ears, and Satan continually repeated, They are now about to put him to death. Thou hast sold him. Knowest thou not the words of the law? He who sells a soul among his brethren and receives the price of it, let him die the death. Put an end to thy misery, wretched one. Put an end to thy misery. Overcome by despair, Judas tore off his girdle, and hung himself on a tree which grew in a crevice of the rock. And after death his body burst asunder, and his bowels were scattered around.